Chapman and Bellerin at the back there. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, in spite of him being a Liverpool fan, he's got a great heart. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 through verse 11. Do we have those scriptures up? Do we have them? Oh, it's up there, but it's not down here. I don't have it down here. Everybody got... Everybody can see that? Okay, let's read it together. We always must read the word together. Let's go. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he preached the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this before. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to the word. We're talking from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. This is a very interesting chapter because it starts, now everything seems to be happening in this little place called Capernaum. Uh, the first call of the disciples was at Capernaum itself. He called his disciples, and then this is the place also he goes into a synagogue. And one of the first things he does when he enters that synagogue is to come against demonic powers. He casts out devils, demons, just by entering into that synagogue. When Jesus comes in, many things begin to change. Come on, amen. Amen. When Christ comes in, things begin to happen. So it is in Capernaum that he casts out demons. And then he goes into Peter's house, and the mother-in-law has got a deathly fever. And Jesus raises her up, and she begins to serve Jesus. It happened in Capernaum. Then after that, he goes outside, and there is a man who's got leprosy, full-blown leprosy. And Jesus touches him and speaks a word, and the man gets completely healed. It is also in Capernaum that a woman with an issue of blood comes and touches the hem of his garment and gets healed. It's in Capernaum that he goes to the home of a man called Jairus and raises up her daughter who has died. It all happens in Capernaum. In fact, Matthew's gospel, chapter 4 and verse 13, I think it tells us that Jesus made Capernaum his hometown. Isn't that amazing? Capernaum is hometown. Now, was it because Capernaum was such a nice place that Jesus did all these things? No. In fact, there is a scripture. I, I don't know whether we have that or not. Matthew chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. Listen to what Jesus says about Capernaum. All right. Listen to that one. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades or to hell. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So in other words, uh, Capernaum was a more difficult place than Sodom itself. It was a very hard place because the people refused to believe Christ in spite of all the miracles that he was doing. They just simply did not want to submit themselves to Christ as the Lord, okay? So why does Jesus come to this town again and again? One, because it was a difficult place. Because it was hard. But also, like if you heard last Sunday's message, Jesus saw people differently. 
He didn't see just a person with demons. He didn't see people with sicknesses. He saw individuals that really needed help from above. Come on. I think we are all here because we realize that we need help beyond the natural. We need help from above. Come on, amen. Huh? We need God to intervene. And so Jesus saw them and he was the one. He came. He said, if anyone has seen the, if anyone wants to know the Father, then have a good look at me. He that has seen me has seen the Father because this is the Father heart of God. Not the, the, the physical aspect of him, but the very character, the very love, the very compassion that he uh, uh, showed to every person. He says, this is the heart of the Father. God is not against us. God is for us. Come on. Amen. He loves us. So he came deliberately into that place because they needed help. All these people needed help. It was a town, in fact, twice in that same portion. And later on, it says many who had demonic problems. All right. So it was a town that was infested with demonic powers. And they needed help. And how can they get help? He knew that their hearts were hard, but still he wanted to keep going there because it was a difficult place. It was a place that needed help. But the second most important thing is, it says in that verse that when they found out he was at home. That's what I want to bring across to you this morning. When they found out Jesus was at home. Somehow he found a house that made him feel at home. And once he found that house that made him feel at home, he decided, I'm going to keep coming back. Come on, amen? Once he found a house that had made him feel at home, he decided, I'm going to stay. So this morning, very quickly, if I can, I'm going to give you seven points. I'll take about 20 minutes for each point, so we should finish by 2 o'clock. Uh, some of you are getting very nervous already. <laughs> what I want to talk about this morning is what happens when Jesus finds a home. What happens when Jesus finds a home? Well, the first thing is the blessings will overflow. Come on. See, he, he was there. He had healed Peter's mother-in-law. He had touched the leper and then he left for a season. Now, sometimes God does some good things for us and then he leaves for a season just to find out what's going to happen with our lives. And very often, everything goes back to routines. Nothing's happening. The house is once again empty. Why? Christ has gone. Nothing is taking place. But the moment he comes in, I want you to know that whenever Jesus entered into a certain situation or a certain place or a certain home, the place becomes crowded. Now, we may not like all the people that came, but the point is this. The point behind the principle is this. When Christ comes in, the blessings overflow. There's no room even at the door. Come on, amen. Huh? Because when he blesses, he blesses abundantly. I am very blessed in the sense that I've had some experiences some, uh, some people would give an arm and a leg for. Uh, when we were little kids, my dad was the chief clerk of the general hospital in Penang. And so, because he was the chief clerk, he could get the medical bungalow, which was located in Telok Bahang. How many of you from Penang? How many of you know where Telok Bahang is? You know where Telok... So he used to get the medical bungalow at Telok Bahang. At that time, no hotels, you know, so it was very nice, little bungalow, and our family would go there, okay? Now, I want you to know, at that time, we didn't have car and all that. We all took the bus, all right? Now, remember, I come from a family of 11 children. So we had do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, re, mi, fa. 11, all right? All lining up, taking the bus and going over, carrying mats, carrying pot of curry and everything else, all the cooking stuff and everything, all going down to, uh, to Telok Bahang. Now, what, what I want to share was, beside where the medical bungalow, there was a small little community of Malabar fishermen. Now, if you know anything about Malabar fishermen, they come from southwestern India. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they, I mean, they are darker than night, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because they are, they are uh, is Mrs. Kung here? Mrs. Kung, okay, all right. 
Mrs. Kung here? Where? Oh, there. Okay. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Kung. They are not darker than that. I mean, they are black. Okay. So anyway, she likes to use the word black. Oh, you are so black one. Okay. <laughs> she, you know, she looked at me. Oh, yeah, Pastor, you are so black. Huh? Okay. So I have to tell her the difference between black and brown. So anyway, uh, <laughs> they, they would go out fishing. Malaba fishermen would go out fishing. Uh, they would leave at about 5.30 in the evening. And then at about 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, they would bring the boats in. And then they will always sing. They will sing and pull the nets in. I mean, about 15 of them, you know, with their families. And all. But the fishermen would sing and pull in the nets. And when I thought about uh, Peter, uh, I thought, you know, maybe it was something like that. So Peter comes, uh, and he's got his boat, and they are washing the nets because, you know, the Nothing really happened. Jesus comes by and he says, can I borrow, you know the story, can I borrow your boat for a while? And they say, okay, sure, you know. And he takes the boat, goes out a little bit just off the shore so that he can stand there and preach to the people. After he's spoken to all the people, he says, Peter, you know, I feel so good. You, you made me feel so at home. So tell you what, let's go out into the deep so that you can get a good catch of fish. And Peter goes, it's in the afternoon. No fisherman goes out and fishes in the afternoon. That's a bad time to fish. I'm a fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter. What do you know about fishing? But listen, as they go out, you know the story. They bring in a net that they cannot even pull in because there is an abundance of fish. When Jesus comes into a situation, the first thing is there will be a release of abundance. But the thing I want, to, uh, I want you to keep in mind is make him feel at home. All right? The blessings of God are untold. I mean, Joseph is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. The moment Potiphar brought him into the house, everything began to get blessed to the point where jo uh, the, uh, Potiphar says, listen, I'm taking my hands off all this stuff. You go ahead. You run the whole business. Amen. Come on. You must believe that the word of God is true. When you make Jesus feel at home, when he has found a house that has made him feel at home, where he can say, I'm coming home. That's why we keep saying, welcome home. Remember our church, we say, welcome home. We want Jesus to feel at home here as well. Because when he is at home, good things begin to happen. All right, second thing. The second thing that happens is you begin to have an open heavens. They remove the roof above him. No more ceiling. No more, oh, I've reached that and I somehow cannot get my breakthrough. That is taken off. Come on. Amen. You start to have an open heavens above you. Can I hear an amen? amen? Through the scriptures, you can find when a person met with God, somehow, no matter who he was, one of the characters in the Bible was a real cheater. His name was Jacob. Running away, cheated. I mean, the guy's character did not match the meeting of God with him. I mean, he did not qualify to meet with God. But that's why God comes into our lives. Because we need him. Come on. If we don't need him, if we feel that everything is okay, my life is all so good, then, then we don't need God. God says, okay, fine. You, you, you just keep on functioning without me. But the moment he sees that we really need him, here is a man who really wanted God to bless him. He's running out. He's all alone. He's got nothing, just the clothes on his back. And suddenly God meets him. What does God do? Give him a dream of an open heaven. And Jacob says, man, this is good. When God comes into a situation, there is an open heaven. The moment Jesus was baptized uh, by John in the Jordan River, the Bible says the heavens were open. Can I say this to you? When Jesus was baptized and the heavens were open, now, with Christ, the heavens will always remain open. With Christ. Because once he opened the heavens, John, what, John, uh, what Jacob saw was just a little opening and angels ascending and descending on a ladder. But now Jesus comes on the scene and the heavens are open. Peter goes up to pray on the rooftop and the heavens being open, he said. Stephen is being stoned to death and he sees the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. As long as Christ is welcome, then we can have an open heaven. Can I hear an amen? amen? Number three, the root cause of all our problems will be dealt with. 
Sometimes we do not know why or what is happening. The first thing Jesus says to him is, your sins are forgiven you. Doesn't heal the man, he goes right down to the root cause of what is happening. The problem with you is, of course Jesus doesn't, he just forgives the man. He doesn't go down and say, all right, now this is what you did, man. You went and messed up your life. That's why you are now paralyzed. That's why you are now in this situation. Nothing of the kind. He just goes, listen, your sins are forgiven you. One of the things that many people do not like us to preach on is this thing called sin. But sin is the root cause of all the problems that have entered into this world. The Bible calls it sin. Bible says that for this purpose, Jesus was manifested. The works of the devil, which is sin. When sin came into the world, we don't like that word, but that is the word God wants us to deal with. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this is where God wants us to be. But we have all sinned and fallen short of where God wants us to be, where God wants us to live. God never wanted us to live under depression. Never created any man to live in poverty. Never wanted anyone to live in sicknesses. Come on. Oh, pastor, you preach on prosperity gospel. Definitely, I'd rather preach prosperity than poverty. Come on. Oh, you talk about all healing, everything, divine health. Oh, yes, I'd rather preach on divine health than to preach on sickness. Because Jesus said this. Listen, when you read the book of Revelation, this is how it ends. The tabernacle of God is with man. Not the tabernacle of God is in heaven. The tabernacle of God is with man. He will be their God. And they shall be his people. And he shall wipe away all tears. Where do we cry? On earth. Not in heaven. There shall be no more pain. Why? Because he's walking there to remove all pain. Hello. He who believes in me shall never die, but he shall live. There shall be no more death. Come on. The tabernacle of God is with man. His name shall be called Emmanuel. For that means God with us. It's sad when we live God without us. When God is with us. Come on, amen. The tabernacle of God. So he deals with the root cause. And when that problem is dealt with. You know there was a problem in Israel. And uh, they were having poisoned water. Poisoned water. So the prophet of God took some salt. And he went to the spring. Find out where the water was coming out from. From the very root source. And poured the salt in. Now you would get salty water. But it's just that. That was just a, sim, a, 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 a way of God working a miracle. God just turned the whole situation around. Ordinary becomes extraordinary. Sweet water began to flow. The poison was removed. Come on, amen. Why do you think he told Moses to nail a, a brazen serpent on a pole and lift it up? Because the people were being bitten by serpents. Representing sin. And poison was killing them. So he said, if you just look, I have taken away the sting. I've taken away the, the poison of the serpent. Nailed it to that post. A picture of Christ dying for us on the cross. Taking away all our sin. He became sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God. Amen. The root cause of the problems that we face. We have to say, Lord, I, I, I really have to say, I'm sorry because of sin. Forgive me of my sin. See, if there's no confession, then there's no forgiveness. Amen? We confess that we have sin. Number four, prayer becomes easy. Jesus asked them, why do you question within yourself? And to me, that is basically... Him saying, listen, before you even voice out what you're feeling on the inside, I know about it. Come on, amen? I know. See, he, th there is no condemnation in his voice towards it. It's not like, huh, you guys think what? You're, you think I don't know what you're thinking? Huh? 
You're questioning in yourself whether I'm God or not. There is no pride in the way Jesus is saying it. He's just saying, you, you got a problem. Share it, man. You got a question in your heart. Share it. You've got a why. Ask me. Don't be afraid to ask me. Come on. One of the things that I'm, I keep trying to emphasize to all of you is that be frank. For God loves truth in the inward parts. Doesn't like us to have a pretense on, oh God, you are so good. God, you are wonderful. You dare not have, you dare not open and voice out what you're feeling on the inside. If you're hurting, tell him you're hurting, man. If you're upset, tell him you're upset. Tell him you're angry. Tell him all your problems. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry, come on, everything to God in prayer. Paul's secret of success was simple. In everything by prayer and supplication. Not in some of the things, not in spiritual things, but in everything. God, could you tell me why my, my wife is so misbehaved? Richard, stand on your chair. Okay. <laughs> huh? Why, why? I mean, why is this happening to my kid? Ask him the questions. I've got questions as a pastor. Why is this not happening? I read in the Bible and I, I see two different worlds. I see the Christian world today. And, and I was sharing just the other day, we had this pastor's meeting and pastor's prayer together. Then after that, after the prayer thing, we had another meeting. Pastors wanted to meet concerning uh, 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 the cemetery issue in Shah Alam, and we're sitting down. And I, I just said to one of the pastors, aren't we so different from what the Bible ministers were and we are, you know, we are so different. I mean, I said, I'll give you an example. I said, just, just a simple example. I said, did you notice that in the Bible, wherever the people went, for example, Peter, uh, Peter and John, they go to the temple, the guy is lying there and he's crippled, right? And they raise him up. And Jesus sees this person who is crippled, raise him up. Everywhere they go, they see guys down and they raise the guys up. But today, pastors want the guys all to fall down. <laughs> if they don't fall down, they push them down. Bible time, they raise them up. Nowadays, everybody looking for people to fall. Bible times, no fall, lift. <laughs> True or not? Why must people fall? I don't want them to fall. I want them to be stand up and leave the place up and strong and leaping and jumping and praising God. I'm not looking for people to fall. If they fall, sometimes I have to say, don't fall, stand up. Why must fall? Oh, the power of God. The power of God makes you strong to walk out and get work done. To be a better husband. To be a better wife. Amen. Not, not, I mean, okay, okay, the power of God touched you. Fell down, that's wonderful. Some people feel because they didn't fall, that means they're not spiritual enough. Maybe because uh, I'm not spiritual, that's why I cannot fall one. How many times people pray for me? I cannot. One pastor told me that once. Say, David, y'all, sometimes, uh, I mean, I have, I have fallen. Listen, when the power of God really hits, I have flown three chairs down. All right? And, and I know how to stand, huh? Little bit, little bit, Marshall asked me a bend. Little bit only, you know, so you know how to stand, so you don't fall. So I'm just standing like this purposely because I know that, you know, when the guy touched, many people fall, I don't want to fall. So he touched, boom, I flew, man, three chairs back. That was really the power of God. But I don't look forward to falling. Why? Some of the guy behind you cannot catch you. <laughs> now, actually, the conversation began when this church that we were meeting in, the pastors were meeting, uh, all tiles. And so the pastor was telling me, we, we're going to put carpet here at the platform, you know, uh, uh, in front of the platform. I said, why? Because people fall. Eh? He said, yeah, la, people fall. Yo, the other day somebody fell. Eh? And that's where I told him, I said, why? Why we want to see people fall? Eh? Everywhere in the Bible, they keep raising people up. You keep wanting people fall. Fall. I said, never mind. Leave it. Save your money in order to have carpet. <laughs> but here it is. Prayer becomes easy 
when we start to be able to open our hearts to Him and realize that He loves us in spite of the questions we have in our hearts. And He was trying to tell those guys who are really up there to criticize Him, listen man, God really loves you. He knows the questions you have in your heart. You've got questions concerning me, whether I'm really God or not. So it's all right. Are you really God? Can you really answer prayer? Is it true what you say in the Bible, you know, that you do this and do that? Is it true? Ask him these questions. He's not afraid of questions. He created us with the ability to ask questions. Give us our individuality, the, the, the basic thing for every human being. That we can ask questions. It doesn't matter. You're not being irreligious when you begin to ask him questions. Come on, amen. I ask God a lot of questions. Most of the time, he just does not answer he just keeps quiet and that's enough for me because his peace settled down and I know. It's more rhetorical. I know the answer. You're right. You know what I'm saying? The questions we have is more rhetorical. It's like, I know what I'm asking. God, can you not do it? Of course I know he can. But it's just that I need to express myself. It becomes easy when you understand that God reads your heart. He's not so concerned about the vocabulary we use. He's more interested in our heart. Come on, amen. Number five, God reveals himself. Only God can forgive sins, they say. And Jesus goes back. Now you know that the Son of Man has power in heaven and on earth. When Jesus is welcomed into a home, he will make himself known as God. He's not just the head of the house, the unseen guest at every meal. He is God. Amen? He is God. And, and that's why, you know, we, we, our worship of Him begins to rise up in our hearts of who He is. He's not just an ordinary man. He has conquered death. The grave is empty. He died on the cross for us, went to the tomb, but He rose again on the third day. That's what we celebrate. He is God. Amen. Seated at the right hand. All authority. That's why he said, when you pray in my name, things begin to happen. He will reveal himself as God. Number six, burdens are removed. That good. It's good to have friends like these four guys who don't give up on you. The man had suffered a long time, but the friend stuck by him. Thank God for friends who carry you through. I'm so great. I'm where I am today. Blessed by God because you carried me. Some of you carried me. God bless pastor. God bless his family. Oh God, please help pastor. He's such a terrible preacher. Anoint him. He needs you so badly, God. I mean, look at him. Just he needs you. And you prayed. And because you prayed, God is blessed. You carried me. I'm so grateful I've got friends who carry me. I know them. I will not mention them by name, but I know. The way some of you pray for me. You, are car you carried me. And placed me at the feet of Jesus. I'm grateful. It's good to have friends who carry you. Amen. Grateful for every person. None of us have arrived at a place where we think we did it on our own. We don't know the number of things that have happened. The reason why the church is where it is today is because of prayers that have been prayed. People have been carrying the burden for a long time. It's a difficult burden. Four guys have to carry this guy. I do not know how many pounds he weighed. <laughs> Must have been a big guy. But they carried him and carried him and carried him. Every time they would go and visit with him and, and try to encourage him. And the man, because of sin, he, you know, once sin comes in, it creates a lot of, of bitterness and anger and hurts. And, you know, you just want to lash out, especially when you become paralyzed. You get even more angry at the world and angry at this God. But these guys never gave up, man. One day, somebody heard about Jesus. I do not know which one of the four friends, but someone, somebody heard. And they decided, man, we're going to take him and place him in the presence of Jesus. That's all we're going to do. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to do any of these things. But we know one thing. We have heard so much about this Jesus and what he can do. We're going to carry this guy, man. 
I don't want to go. I don't want to go. What's the point? God doesn't answer prayer. If God really is a good God, why must this happen to me? I don't like this stuff. I don't care what you say. We're going to carry you. Whether you like it or not, we're going to carry you. So they fight through the bitterness of this man. They carry him all the way. They find out where Jesus is lodged at. They go to the place. They realize Jesus is at home in that place. If Jesus is at home, then we must find a way. Jesus is comfortable in that house. We must bring him and place him at the feet of Jesus. Somehow we must find. So they come in and there's a crowd outside the house. No, they cannot enter. Even at the doors, people are outside. They cannot enter the house. And in the... uh, Middle Eastern house, they would have a flat roof on the top and then a a stairs on the side of the house going up so that they can dry things up there and sleep up there in the summer, you know, that kind of stuff. You you all go, in fact, come with us to Punjab, man. (laughs) Come with us (laughs) to Punjab and and, uh, come for the mission trip. It's going to be an exciting time. You would see all the houses, most, um, every house does not have a roof like this kind. It's all flattened. So you go up there. And they go up to this flare. Of course, they don't have multi-story, just, just one floor kind of thing. They go up there. They, they think to themselves, no matter what, they see the crowd, they say, listen, we, we're not giving up. You know, when I go to a restaurant and I see the restaurant pack, I, 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 because number one, food is nothing to me. You know, I, I basically eat to live, unlike most of you. Okay. All right. Many, oh, pastor, you must go there and taste this. Oh, pastor, you must go there. The whole life is, oh, pastor, you must try here. You must go, you know, Sakinchan, this place. You must go that place, must eat that one. Oh, you must, they live to eat, man. <laughs> All right. Not eat to live, huh? For me, I just eat, if, if, if it's crowded, ah, let's go to another place. Just, just put some food in me, that's about it. I'm not interested in, oh, this one is nice, that one is nice. Of course, if the whole group goes, we have fellowship, wonderful. I like the fellowship more than anything. I think most of us, eating is basically fellowship, correct? All right. Three of you disagree. For you, eating is everything. <laughs> what do you mean fellowship? I mean, I'm eating the meal. I don't care. You want to talk, you talk. I want to just stuff my mouth. Okay, all right. But you still, this guy still went on, carried him up there, and eventually, they're not giving up. No matter how big the crowd is, they are not giving up. Let's find another way. Now, they know that they have to go up the roof, one. Number two, they have to get ropes. Number three, they've got to get instruments to somehow make a hole. They didn't come prepared to make a hole in the roof. They had to find some kind of instruments up there. They, they, uh, the, the inconvenience, the, the hard work that goes into carrying a burden... Believing that when I place this person in the presence of Jesus, it's going to go. Something's got to happen when I place this burden at the feet of Jesus. So they work their way through it, break a hole, bring the man down. Jesus seeing their faith. Touches the man. Oh, when they go home. No more burdens, man. They don't have to carry the burden back home again. Come on. I pray this morning as we come into the presence of God, you will go back light-shouldered. That you will learn to leave it here. Our problem is we bring a problem to God. Say, God, I've got this problem with me. Please help me, God. Yeah. So we call up in the afternoon. How are you doing? Oh, your pastor, still la, the problem. La. Can, you, can you leave it there? Can? Just, just, just leave it there. So I'm going to leave it in your presence. I'm going to walk out light-shouldered. I'm going to walk out cool. I come here like stressed out in the presence of the Lord. Listen, church, we've got to believe the Bible. If the Bible is true in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy, then we must live with joy in our hearts. The burdens can drop off our shoulders. Ah, what a wonderful thing it it is. That's why the Bible says in everything, by prayer and... Be anxious over nothing. Anxiety has crowded some of the minds sitting here this morning. 
Just so anxious, just so anxious, thinking about what's going on. So many things are in your mind. You've got no control. That's why we need divine help. We cannot handle it. If we can, we would have handled it a long time ago. We cannot handle a lot of the stuff we are going through. If we could, we would have done it before and we wouldn't have the problems. But because we are carrying it on and on, year after year after year. Listen, because of that, we need divine help. So Paul says in every, don't be anxious, bring it before God in prayer. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall govern, rule, garrison your heart and your mind. Hallelujah. You believe that? Amen. Of course, last of all, you get a testimony. People are amazed. God is glorified. You've got a testimony. Amen. I went and this is what happened to me. I went there heavy hearted, but I leave light hearted. Jesus did something good for me. Let me just close with this. I shared with you before, when we have a visitor coming to our home, a guest, take them, fetch them from the airport, we come to the home, then he comes in, and then we, you know, bring him in, and we shout first, Rocky, down, Rocky, down, down, Rocky. Because <laughs> there's a mad dog in the house. I mean, we've got a Doberman. In the house. And that dog will slobber you to death. He will not bite you. He'll just... <laughs> you get Every visitor that comes, he just jumps up and says, Give me a hug. Kind of thing, you know? Every visitor. And he's got sharp claws, you know, sometimes. He scratched me out the other day. Come on, just jump. So we have to say, Rocky, down. That's the first thing we do when a visitor comes in. <laughs> Second thing we say to him, All right. Let me help you to the room. So we take him up to the room, put his bag down, turn on the air con. This is your room. This is the bathroom. You know, you don't, you know, heater, how to use the water, hot water. Here are your towels, everything. All right, make yourself very comfortable. Then we take him downstairs, sit down in the hall, chat a little bit. Then we say, okay, if you want to rest, you can go up to the room. Then we say, okay, if you want to go up now, first let me tell you, this is the kitchen and, and you got hot water and here's coffee and tea and or whatever you want to make, Milo and, and, and a little bit of whiskey on the other side. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, so... <laughs> All right, so, so, all right, we, yeah, here's the stuff. And, uh, make, and then we say, you know, sit down on a, uh, here's the TV, uh, the TV control. You want to watch news, sports, you know, movies, whatever. Uh, uh, make yourself at home, make yourself at home, all right? Please make yourself at home. What I do mean is make yourself at home, but please do not go inside my bedroom. <laughs> Come on. Don't, 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 don't go inside my kid's room. Yeah? I mean, that room, the kitchen, I mean, there are certain parts you make yourself at home, but please, there are certain places off limits. You see, but if we want Jesus to be at home, we got to say to him, I'd, I'd like you to come into my kid's room anytime. You feel, you know, the kids are making a little bit of fuss. Come inside, read them a story, put your hands on them. Anytime, anytime, come inside the kid's room. You know what, Jesus, I really need you in my bedroom. Because, you know, my marriage has got, sometimes we have problems, man. We need you to sit there. We need you to bless us. We need you to make our marriage work. Because you, the first thing you ever did in miracles, in miracles was to heal a wedding. So you must, I, I want you to come into our bedroom. I want you to bless us, bless our relationship. We're having such a lot of problems. Listen, are you hearing me this morning? Welcome into my bedroom. Come on. Not just certain parts where you, apart from that, hands off. All right? In the morning when you get up and you say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm off to work, man. Would you come with me? Because there are certain decisions I have to make, certain clients I have to meet. Uh, I've got certain sales that must go right. Would you please come with me? You're making him feel at home. And when Jesus is at home, good things begin to happen. Come on, amen. 
I mean, he really must be at home. You cannot say, okay, I'll have you only in this part of my life, the religious part. Apart from that, no. But he wants to be at home in every area. Then watch the blessing of God. I say that on the authority of the word of God. I'd like you to come and please, please uh, visit with my son. Vis- visit with my daughter. Uh, they, they are overseas. They are in the States or they are in Australia. W- would you please feel at home? Please go any time of the day. Visit with them. Come on. Bless my children. Bless my grandkids. Bless my business. Come with me, Jesus. I want you to feel at home even in my business. You have the first say in my business. I I may be the boss, but I'm asking you to give me counsel. Give me advice. I'm I'm meeting this client or I'm meeting this patient. Would you help me? Be with my hand. Be with my... I always would say, Lord, give me the tongue of the learned so that I would speak well. Words that would help people. Come on. Amen. Amen. You need that in your working places. Six days shall thou work. One day you come to church. Six days you need him badly, man. I'm not where you guys are at. I'm not out there in the world facing all these things. I'm safe and sound in my own room. I've got God and me and we both are happy. I love this job. The other day I said to God, I know what my purpose in life is. I was telling my wife, I said, I know my meat is to do the will of God. I can say that now because I know what the will of God for my life is, what the will of God, and I'm going to fulfill it. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. But you see, I don't meet the kind of people you guys meet. You need him more than I need him in that sense. I need him to communicate him to you so that you understand that if Jesus can be made real to you, you give him a place that you can say, feel at home, Jesus. Good things start happening. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Welcome him into every area of your life and watch God do some amazing things. Let's stand together, shall we? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's wonderful that the guy stood up. He mastered the thing that mastered him. At one moment, he was just controlled by that.